Hebrews chapter 12. If you hit James, John, and Revelation, you've gone too far. It's right before all of those. Hebrews chapter 12. Actually, let's back up a couple of verses. Let me move this table for a second. We'll see how that turns out. Okay, Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be backing up a couple of verses here. Starting, you know what, verse 32 of chapter 11, and we're just going to read and kind of just, you know, truncate it after a couple of verses. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the enemies, the armies of the aliens, or the enemies of the outsiders. Um, women received their dead raised up to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mocking and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered around in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us that should not be made perfect apart from us, let's go before the Lord. So, Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, and we are excited. We are, I am ecstatic to hear from you tonight, God. I'm ecstatic to be able to, to read through your word, to talk through it, to go through this incredible chapter of 12, and to just learn alongside my brothers and sisters, what you will teach us tonight. So, Father, I pray be with us, lead us, and guide us, speak to us tonight, God. May we learn from what the apostle in the book of Hebrews says, and may we just learn to love you more with every single breath that we have. I pray speak to every single one of us here tonight in that voice that we know, God, that beating of our heart, uh, the, the, the hunter in our heart, God. And so I pray, be with us, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be holy and acceptable unto you, O Lord God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So what is going on here? What's going here through the book of Hebrews? Well, a lot of things. See, for those who uh, don't know, and for those who do, I'll be quick, but those who don't know, the book of Hebrews is written to the Jewish Christian converts of the first century church. Now, the apostle here, he is, he is reading and he is reaching out to those early Christians because this was a book written in about 60 AD. So it would have been roughly 30 years after Jesus ascended into heaven. Now, these Jewish Christian converts, they would have come literally from the law. They would have gone from sacrificing, believing that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the propitiation, propitiation for our sins, and therefore... Jesus being the more holy and perfect sacrifice, we no longer need to offer sacrifices. And that's what these Christians, these Jewish Christians, believed. And as they eagerly expected and waited for Jesus' return, you know, one year turned into two, turned into three, turned into five, turned into ten years, twenty years, thirty years, and they start looking around and going, he said he'd be right back. Where is he? And things started to get harder. Things started to happen in their lives. Trials started to occur. Suddenly, I mean, you know, within a couple of years, Stephen was killed. He was literally stoned. The, the church in Jerusalem scattered abroad. They ran to every corner because persecution was so bad. The apostle Paul, before he became saved, was actually one of those who would go into houses, ripping out men and women from their houses and basically sending them to execution. And so the persecution was harsh. Things were hard for Christians. Now that's weird. If Jesus is Messiah and God is a good God, why would he allow his followers to go through such terrible trials? 
Why would he allow such terrible things to happen to those who claim that, that they are his? Why do hard, bad things happen to those who believe in Jesus? What's up with that? And so there were questions. They were saying, okay, well, maybe he's not it. Maybe he's not. Maybe there's something else. Maybe, you know what? The law was okay. You know, that wasn't too bad. Maybe we should just go to, back to that. You know, that worked. And so the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't go back to those things that were okay. Don't settle for an Ishmael when you could have an Isaac. In fact, it's not even a night and day comparison because Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. The law brings death because we realize that through the law, man, I am a sinner. If you don't believe you're a sinner, man, just read through the book of Leviticus or, I don't know, ask the person, ask your closest friend, he'll tell you. <laughs> um, at least they told me. Um, so that being said, so there is this question, there's this, there's this concern, and the apostle who wrote the book of Hebrews is saying, no, 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 Jesus is way better than anything that you could ever hope or dream of. He's better than angels. He's better than the prophets. He's better than the saints of old. He's better than Moses. He's better than the law. In fact, he has fulfilled the law, and he's the one who is continuously fulfilling the law as he prays on our behalf before God, who we get to come boldly before the throne because when God looks upon us, he doesn't see our sins. He sees Jesus' sacrifice. Now, things were hard for these Christians in the book of Hebrews. In fact, they were only going to get harder. The next, uh, the, the Caesar before, uh, the Caesar that was reigning during this time, he didn't particularly like Christians. And the one who was to come was, uh, was a little no-name little no -name Caesar by the name of Nero. And man, he didn't like Christians. This was rough, and it was only going to get rougher, and it was going to get hard, and some Christians, or it was already getting hard, and these Christians were going, hey, maybe we should go back. And so the title of this message, if you are a note taker, is Persevere. And so we just got done going through chapter 10. We spent two weeks on it or excuse me, chapter 11, we spent two weeks on it because it talks about all of the saints of old. And what it's saying here is that there are so many different ways that these saints of old went out. Um, let's see. 36, still others had trials of mocking, of scourging, of chains, imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword, wandered around in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. These are, the, these are the ones that God chose. Isaiah, the, 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 prophet that God, the, the prophet that spoke so much about the Messiah, was cut in half, tradition says. I just got done reading the book of Jeremiah, and man... Jeremiah weeps for his country. He weeps for his people. There's a verse I just read the other day in, uh, in Lamentations. So uh, Judah falls, and Jeremiah is so distraught that in chapter 2 of Lamentations, it says, My eyes fail with tears. My heart is troubled. My bile is poured out on the ground. Have you, ever, have you ever cried so much that you are vomiting and there's nothing left? How did the prophet Jeremiah die? He was stoned, tradition says. People got sick and tired of hearing him and just killed him. What in the world? This man followed God with everything. This man could hear God better than most men right now. This is hard. This is hard. This is tough stuff. But look at verse 38. It says, Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. 
And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. What's the promise? It's the Messiah. They had faith in the coming Messiah. They believed that one day the Messiah would come, who would make wrong right, who would take sin from the earth, who would reestablish the connection between God and man through Jesus Christ. And they had faith. Abraham died believing that he was going to be the father of a great nation that would eventually save all of the other nations. But when he died, he only had Isaac. And there were so many other saints that, who were told by God, hey, this is what's going to happen. And they died not seeing it. But still they had faith. Still they persevered. And still, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, that they were not, let's see, of whom the world was not worthy. So that's how we entered chapter 12. <laughs> a heck of a primer if you ask me. And this is what the writer says in verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. You have yet not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Boof! These are some tough Words, these are some beautiful words. These are some strong words. Verse 1 starts out the chapter by saying, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which easily ensnares us. And this is where we're going to focus on, you know, we're going to run around this chapter, but we're going to come back. What things have you not given to God? Is there a time in your life that you were closer to Jesus than you are right now? Praise God if not. But was there a time in your life when you were on fire for him that there were mornings that you would wake up and you'd say, praise God, whatever you want to do in my life, I'll do it. And whatever you tell me to go, I'll go. Was there a time that you were completely on fire and now that fire has started to fade and perhaps that fire is now more of a smolder or an ember? I don't know, and I pray that that's not the case. I pray that every single day we're more and more in love with Jesus than we ever have been. But the question is, is that true? Is that how it is right now? Because if it's not, then something in your life needs to change. Something in my life needs to change if that's not the case. Now, that doesn't mean you need to muster up this fake this fake, like, oh, yeah, no, I'm doing real good, brother. How are you? You know, <laughs> I actually know if you're, <laughs> this, is, this is something, and you can use this in your conversations with people at church. But if you say, hey, how you doing, brother? And they say, oh, God is good. That means they're going through it. <laughs> <laughs> or one of my favorite ways, if someone asks me, how are you doing? I go, oh, it's good to see you. I tap them on the shoulder and I keep walking. <laughs> that means I'm going through it. And that means, you know, if you say, oh, man, God's good, then I go, oh, boy, you doing all right, though? <laughs> you know, trials are okay. Hard times are okay. <sighs> They're all right. And as we dive more and more into this chapter, we'll see the reason for trials. We'll see the reason for persecution. We will see the reason that these things happen in our lives. Number one, it's a fallen world, but number two... There's a few other things inside. But 
when trials happen, when afflictions happen, when we feel that fire is fading, we have to ask ourselves, is there anything that I'm holding on to? Are there any other weights or is there any sin in my life that I haven't given to God? You know, the, uh, the oh man, I, I'm going to reference Jeremiah so much tonight, I just feel it. But the people, so back about 700 years before Jesus shows up on the scene, the kingdoms of Jerusalem, or excuse me, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah split in half. And they run rampantly right into sin, both, both of them. Israel just full-on sprinted, and Judah, Judah got jealous looking what was up at their older sister and then fully followed them later on. And so Israel gets taken away. God says, no, you can't do that, and he ends up uh, punishing them. And then he also does the same to Judah. And, he, and Jeremiah is going, guys, please, please repent. Please turn away. Please stop praying to the queen of heaven. Please stop praying to Baal. Please stop praying to these Asheroth poles. And run to Jesus, or excuse me, run to God. Same guy, they just didn't know that. And so, <clears throat> but what the people would do is they would actually go pray to God, ask for forgiveness, and then go pray to their gods and pray to them and go like their heart was divided. They had sin. They had literal physical idols in their life. But I propose Christian. You know, we, we in, our modern, in our modern Western era, we, we're, we're too great for, for idols. But man, that first thing that you think about in the morning, that could possibly be your idol. What brings you security in your life? Is it your job? Is your net worth what brings you worth? That was a tough one when I realized that. Because if it's not God, you have an idol. I have an idol. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest... Yeah, look at this. This is weird. Lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Is, how do I say it? Lest you become weary in your soul. If there is a sin in your life, if there is something, an addiction in your life, some sort of thing that is keeping you from fully running after God, and you try again and again, and you go, God, I can't stop. I don't know what to do. I'm too weak. I can't do this. Well, there's a few things that the Word of God here says. Oh, man. <laughs> Verse 4 is the real punch, but we'll go back before that. Um, number one, realize, Christians, that we are running a race. That this isn't just a walk in the park. In fact, when you were saved, yeah, you get into heaven. Yeah, you can get on the bus and you can sit there and you can wait till the end of the time. But we're called to run. We're called to run the race. In fact, the Apostle Paul says that I not only run the race, but I run to win. I run so that I may achieve the prize, that I may reach for the prize. I, uh, my brothers and I were looking at doing a, <laughs> an Ironman, or excuse me, a, a half Ironman, which is insane, just completely insane. For those who don't know, an Ironman is two miles swimming, 120 miles biking and then to cap it all off you finish it you finish a full marathon and that's what a full iron man is and you don't just go out and do an iron man 
I can't, I can't go out tomorrow and just do an Ironman. It takes months and months and months of preparation, perhaps even years of preparation. And I run all of that for a perishable crown. Great sprinters run to achieve, uh, to beat marathons. Didn't someone beat a marathon in something like three hours, something insane? And they discipline their bodies for a perishable crown. They spend their whole lives. Michael Phelps spent his whole life trying to shave off another second, another second, another second. And they do all of that for a perishable crown. But look, do we run after God with the same fervency? Do we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do we run to not only just, man, I'm just, I'm just happy to make it across the finish line, or are you running in order to win the prize, win the gold? It's interesting, Paul in his last book to Timothy says, I have run the race, I have finished the race. I held nothing back. Can that be said of us? Can that be said of us right now? I don't know if that can be said about me. But you know what I'm going to try and do? I'm going to try and cast away every weight, every single thing that holds me back, every little sin that keeps me from seeing God, every smudge on my windshield I have to wipe off so that I can get a clearer vision of what's in front, what's most important. The older I get, the more I realize that those age-old hymns are so true, and it really bothers me. But turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full at his wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Run to him. Why do we bother keeping looking at things on the left and the right? We know they don't satisfy. Why do we bother? Well, Caleb, it's too hard. You don't, uh, you don't know, man. Like, this thing has me hooked. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt, man. But here's something that the last part of verse 2, or excuse me, the last part of 3 and 4, <sighs> these are rough bits. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Talking of Jesus who literally hung there on the cross when they spat at him, when they... When I spat at him, when I hated him, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. While I hated him, he loved me, he died for me. And it says to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Oftentimes, if you ever try to quit something or, you know what, let's just say you're trying to fast. Let's just start there. Let's say you're just trying to do a 24-hour fast. And you go, okay, well, I'm not going to eat breakfast. I'm not going to eat delicious breakfast with eggs and jam and butter and a nice cup of coffee. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to think about it. And then you go, okay, well, I can, I can just, you know, I can keep going. And maybe you can muscle your way through and you muscle your way through lunch. And you're like, oh, man. And you like, man, if you work it somewhere, it's probably someone's cooking up some really good food in the kitchen and, you know, probably wafted over and you're like, and then you're like, all right, well, I can keep going. And you just don't think about food. Just don't think about food. Just don't think about food. And the whole time you're thinking about food. And, I mean, if you're me, I cave by dinner. Like someone, and then, you know what? It's always someone's like, hey, you know, I brought cookies. It's like, oh, well, I'd be rude if I didn't do it. <laughs> uh, but no, but like, and so what, the reason why I bring that up is because we are oftentimes looking at the wrong thing when we are casting away sins, when we are casting things away instead of looking at, well, hey, I got to stop doing this. I can't be doing this. I can't, I just can't be doing it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Consider everything, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged. The apostle says right here, well, oh, this is how you do it. All you do is you turn your eyes upon Jesus. Jesus said, love the Father with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. And then as the, as the real uh, coup de grace comes, 
Verse 4, it says, you have not yet resisted to blood, striving against sin. Now, two things come to mind when I read this verse. Uh, The first thing that comes to mind, during the time of Martin Luther, there were those that were called the flagellators. And these were a sect of Catholics or sect of Christians who would uh, take a whip, a whip of leather, and every time they had a bad thought, (laughs) I kid you not, this literally happened. In fact, Martin Luther, I believe he actually was a flagellator, Um, but it was definitely people around him. So, bad thought, you physically put to death your flesh. And there are actually people who do this right now in a... in very specific Catholic denominations. There are still people that do this that literally are putting to death their flesh. And it's not pretty. I don't recommend looking it up. Now, I don't recommend this. Because even Jesus said, hey, if God causes, if, if, excuse me, not if God, but if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, chop it off. You realize you do the math, you realize it's your heart that needs to be scooped out. It's because your heart's desperately wicked. At least my heart is. And it's our heart that needs to be saved. So what's being said here when it says, have you resisted unto bloodshed? Well, I look at Jesus. I look at him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I go, wait a minute. He said, God, if there be any other way, if there be any other way at all, if there is any other way that I can... If people can be saved, but not my will, but your will. And it said that when he prayed, he sweated drops of blood. Have you ever been so deeply moved in your heart that you've cried and you can't cry anymore? Have you ever been so moved that you've sweated blood? I haven't. Have you resisted unto bloodshed? This is a high, high calling. It's a high order. But this is what we're called to. Jesus is so good. He's the only thing that satisfies. John Piper says that we are most satisfied when God is most glorified. And as much as I want to disagree with it, man, it's just true. It's just true. Less of me, more of him, and all of a sudden, the things of this earth start to disappear. I become more just instinctively joyful, even though life's falling apart around me. Verse 5. Oh, boy. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjugation to the father of spirits and life and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be takers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but grievous. Nonetheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So then the writer, the apostle of the book of Hebrews, goes on and says, you're going to endure trials. You're going to endure tribulations. You're going to endure chastening, is what it's called. Um... (laughs) I don't know if I should ask for a raise of hands, but did anyone have a uh, a father or mother that that chastened them, that disciplined them? I did. (laughs) And it was good. Man, I was a a big, dumb little kid. 
<laughs> I wanted to know where the walls were, so I ran full force into them. <laughs> and, uh, and I thank God that I had good, strong parents that, uh, that disciplined me when they did. Because um, I'm still not sure if I got it figured out. <laughs> but that being said, why was I disciplined? Why were you disciplined? Why were you chastened? Chances are it's because we were doing something dumb. We were doing something that would maybe potentially end our lives prematurely, or we would, we would not be doing something so smart. I, I knew a guy that you just to run full force into the street, and his mom had to pull him back. He got disciplined for that. You're not supposed to run into the street. You're going to die. And so if we have human fathers and mothers who chasten us, who discipline us, which is a good thing, how much more so if we are doing something that will lead to our destruction? Will God chasten us? Will God discipline us? The word says, uh, do, not, uh, do not be deceived for what you sow, you will reap. Speaking specifically of sin. There is no personal sin that will, oh, it's just me, I don't need to worry about it, it's just my little thing. You know, no one needs to know about it. It will destroy you, Christian. It will destroy your lives and it will destroy those lives around you. Just watch. Like, uh, oh man. <laughs> like gangrene. Like gangrene that it aids into the flesh. And though it might be a small cut, once it becomes infected, it all has to be taken out. And so the Lord chastens us before. In Jeremiah, it says, you reaped, you sowed the wind, and you reaped the whirlwind. And I believe it's the, it's the, it's the mercy of God that chastens us. It's the mercy of God that allows us to go through trials. In fact, uh, we're going to jump into this uh, here in a couple of weeks, but I'm going to jump over to James chapter 1, verse 2. Um, in the James, the brother of Jesus, says in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When we fall into trials, when God chastens us, when things are hard, when we're getting pressed on all sides and beaten, realizing, realize this. That patience having its perfect work, that you may be complete, lacking nothing. This is the purpose of trials. This is the purpose for a hard time. You know, we in the Christian faith, we call them seasons. Oh, I'm going through a rough season, brother. Um, I'm going through a real wintry season, and I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for spring. Those seasons are there to make us more like the image of Christ. Or maybe we just ran full force into sin, and God is <laughs> chastening us. He is disciplining us. If you are a son or a daughter and you are living counter to God, you will be disciplined. I have been, I will be disciplined. Because ultimately, God is not concerned. God is more concerned with where we are going than where we are. One day we will be in the presence of God. We will sing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And I expect to good, spend a good couple thousand years crying out to Jesus saying that. But I can't do that if I hold sin in my heart. I can't do that if I hold an idol in my heart. If I have something else that's on my mind constantly. If I put my trust in anything other than Jesus. If I have my own secret little sin that I don't tell anybody about. That will destroy us. He, and that's why, God, that's why God chastens us. That's why you discipline a child. 
In fact, I'm going to rag on my generation a little bit, but we weren't necessarily disciplined so much. And you get to see the full fruit of that a couple of years ago during COVID. You'll get to see that. <laughs> You'll get to see that quite a bit. That's what happens when you don't discipline a child. They stay a child. But we're going to be called men and women after God's own heart. These men and women of renown, these that trusted God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength, they didn't they, was, they, weren't just a, they weren't just a little kid one day and then God gave them a huge challenge and they rose to it and they became a man and they totally did it. You can't go from bench pressing 45 pounds, just the bar, to 300 pounds. It takes consistency. It takes strength training. It takes building. Look at the life of David. He was a little kid. And by the time he was, I don't know, 14, 15, he had already killed a lion. He had killed a bear. And he's like, and this uncircumcised Philistine's going to talk bad about my God? And so he goes out there and kills him by God's grace. What in the world? That's crazy. But God had already allowed these other trials in his life when he was such a little boy that when he came to his first real challenge, he was like, no, God's got me. I got this. In fact, I know for a fact that because you are challenging the God Most High that you will die. <laughs> and then continuing on, he then has to deal with King Saul. And then he has to deal with so many more problems. And it was a continuous, continuous move, a continuous strength building. We might want to stay kids. We might want to stay children. But that's not what we aim to be. God wants to make us into great men and women fully and completely devoted unto him. I look at men, or excuse me, I look at women like Elizabeth Elliot, who lost her husband at 27 and then moved in with the tribe that killed her husband. And slowly, over the course of time, that tribe got to see this, these people whose, whose men they personally killed, and that whole tribe became saved. Hmm. Oh, we have a little bit of time. So do not, when you go through a trial, man, make sure you learn, <laughs> Right? There's only one thing worse than going through a trial, and that's going through it a second time. So don't despise the chastening. Don't despise these trials. They are for our growth. They are to make us stronger Christians. They are there so that we can begin to hear God's voice more clearly. Do you want to hear God's voice? Do you want to know the difference between the voice that God speaks and the voice in your own head and the voice in the world and the voice of your family and the voice of your boss. And like, do you want to be able to hear God's voice? Because God, God is constantly speaking to us. Constantly. But if I'm not paying attention and I'm not listening, then what good is it? So don't despise chastening. Don't despise trials. Consider it joy when you enter on all various trials and temptations. And I'll try my best too. <laughs> if you endure chastening, God deals with you, verse 7, as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So if you're like, oh, hey, my life's going good. I've never been disciplined. Life's going really well. I can't think of a time that was ever really hard. Uh oh. Just uh, make sure you're believing in the same God. Furthermore, we have. Hu uh, we'll, we'll keep doing. We'll keep going. 
verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but grievous nonetheless. Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained. Therefore, strengthen the hand which hangs down in the feeble knees and make straight the path of your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no one will see the Lord looking diligently lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springs up, cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person. Uh, Does someone have another translation for those two words, for fornicator and profane? We all have the New King James. Nice. (laughs) I guess not. Um, All right. Um, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright, for you know that afterward, what, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought, sought it diligently with tears. Hmm. For you have not come to the mountain that, you, that may be touched and then burned with fire into a blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded and if so much as a beast touched the mountain it shall be stoned or thrust through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses himself said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But when you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirit of just men, made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than that of Abel. Okay, there's a lot here, and we have a little time, so let's jump in. I this week uh, picked up a book called Silence um, by uh, Shusaku Endo. It's historical fiction of, about, of a couple of missionaries who go to Japan uh, during the 1500s. Um, this was just after the Counter-Reformation with Catholics, and so there were a bunch of Jesuit priests who were going out and converting people to Catholicism or converting people to Christianity. And uh, it exploded in Japan, so much so that the government became scared. Like, what's going on here? Suddenly, this foreign religion is coming in. And they persecuted Christians unlike anything else. Uh, One of their first things was they went and and literally uh, uh, crucified 24 Christians just on one day in Nagasaki. And things became worse and worse. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to get people to uh, recant their faith. They were trying to get people to apostatize, is the word. But you guys know Japanese. They're pretty strong. They're strong folk. And so they wouldn't do it. And so the Japanese government looking at that, going, realizing that these people would not recant their faith. They would withstand terrible tortures where you would hang upside down and a small cut was above your eyebrow and you were bound except for one hand. And all you had to do to stop the terrible tortures just to lift your hand up and recant the faith. There were these, uh, these images of Jesus where they, you would have to step on to prove that you're not a Christian. And the Japanese, they wouldn't do it. And so what they ended up doing is they said, well, okay, well, if the Japanese won't do it, then those who are evangelizing, let's try to get them to recant their faith. And so they started persecuting those missionaries. And quite a few people recanted their faith. Those that went to go preach about Jesus recanted their faith due to extreme persecution, not only of themselves, but oftentimes they would persecute or they would literally torture people and say, we will stop this torture if you recant your faith. That's what this book's about. There's also a movie. I haven't watched the movie, but it's a tough read. It's a real tough read. Um, Why do I bring this up? (sighs) 
I bring it up because we in America, unless, I mean, I assume we've been called names. I assume we've been rejected from certain circles of friends. I assume we're not invited to certain, certain parties. But we haven't experienced persecution like that. Not even close. And this was the type of persecution that these Christians were going through during this time. In fact, yeah, if you know anything about Nero, it was just as horrendous. And so, if there is any... How do I say it? If there's anything in our heart... If God is not our king, if God is not our God, then we need to be careful. We need to watch out. We see Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Esau goes out hunting. Jacob's there cooking up a mean stew. And Esau says, man, that smells good. Give it to me. And Jacob goes, hey, yeah, you can have it if you give me your birthright. And Esau goes, yeah, no, I don't care. You can have it. If I'm going to die. What good is a birthright to me if I die? He gives his birthright. He gives it away. Then God was like, okay, yeah, you gave it to Jacob. It's going to be through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob now. For you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it didn't diligently with tears. May we not, in our emotions, betray the one that we love the most. Emotionally, really quickly, may we not give it up. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to sprint through the rest of this, and we'll call it. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they do not escape who refused him who spoke on the earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he promises, saying, yes, once more I will not only shake the earth, but heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have Grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. I'm going to jump back to the beginning of chapter 12 because I think that's probably the best way to end this book. Or excuse me, end tonight. Therefore, also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners from me against him, Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls, you have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. So a few things in conclusion here. Because this is a heavy chapter. This is a heavy, heavy chapter. This is the one that brings the punch. Number one, if there are things in your life that you need to give to God, what am I waiting for? What are you waiting for? We need to give those things. God needs to be our all. Number two, you're not alone. You're not alone in this. This isn't something that you have to muster by yourself. You have a body of Christian brothers and sisters that stand alongside. Though you give, though, though maybe you're conversion to Christianity, though when you became a Christian, you lost friends, maybe you lost family, maybe you lost respect. You gained a family that loves you. You gained a God that loves you, and you're not alone. 
This is some heavy stuff. This is some strong stuff. But you're not alone. You are a part of the body of Christ. And if you, as maybe an eyeball of the body, maybe the right bicep of the, of the body, though you might be the most beautiful eyeball, a Bible, uh, an eyeball outside of the body is worthless. So do not neglect the body. Join into the body. And thirdly, trials happen. Trials happen to good people. Life happens. We, it says in First John that we have three enemies. We have the devil himself, we have our own flesh, and we have the world. And so these three things are warring against us, and God allows some of that to come against us so that we can have further faith in him. It's to strengthen us. It's to grow us. So if you're going through a hard time, don't worry. It's for your growth and it will end. And in fact, for those who have gone through trials and you look at your life before that trial and you look at your life after, have things changed? Have you fallen more in love with Jesus? Because chances are you have. Yeah. So verse 1, chapter 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let's pray. God, these are heavy words. These are strong words but ultimately they're words of love. Discipline's there so that it's your mercy that can save us. <laughs> so God, thank you for trials. Thank you for tribulations. Thank you for making us more like the image of your son. Thank you for saving us. The rest of my life is yours. The rest of my life is yours. Take me and use me. Take us and use us, Father. And may we love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.